I was wondering where you went. <laughs> I, want a, I want a bottle with a screw top. Yeah, yeah. Let me make the dramatic screw top gestures. We don't have a place to put this. Drink up. <laughs> and we hope you all have a great time. Uh, just by way of introductions, my name's Ryan, I'm one of the organizers here, and this is Jarrell, and this is John over here. Uh, so uh, just a few things to get started and then we'll get into the keynote. Um, to start out, if you don't have it yet, you should download the Chicago Roboto app. You can find it on the Play Store. If, uh, if you use an iPhone, then uh, maybe get an Android phone and download the app. <laughs> um, but the app is uh, going to be really helpful for you. It's got the schedule. Uh, you, can, you can favorite everything so you know which, which talks you want to go to. But most importantly for us and for the speakers, uh, as soon as a session is done, um, there will be a button that will allow you to give feedback. And that's super helpful. Uh, we give that information to the speakers. Um, it's just star ratings in different categories. But after each session, if you could just give some feedback, uh, I know our speakers really appreciate that, so that would be really awesome. And you can find that on the Play Store, just Chicago Roboto. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it off to Drill. Cool, yeah. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, one quick reminder, we do have a Google Photos shared album, so if you go to this link here, you can uh, join the shared album. So be sure to take pictures, tweet about Chicago Roboto, use the hashtag <laughs> Chicago Roboto. Uh, if you can, that'll help, uh, you know, Make some noise in Chicago with this with this conference. So that's what we're hoping for. Um, and also one more thing: the first three rows have power in both rooms. So if you need power, just sit in one of the first three rows. You don't know. Yeah. And if you don't need power, don't sit in them. That's it. But you don't have to get up and move. <laughs> um, and then a couple of more just quick things. Um, I don't know if you saw any of the emails, but lunch is um, offsite. We have lunch tickets for about five different restaurants all within about a 10 minute walk. Uh, between now and lunch, after once we go back out there, we'll have them all out there. Just at some point between now and lunch, go out, grab the one you want. I'm gonna put in the attendee Slack, a list of all the places so you kind of look at the menu options and see where they are. The back of the lunch ticket also has their address and a map so that you can find it once you're out moving around. But each of those is good for um, 
up to $15 to spend in those places. Most of them came up with a menu, just to trade the voucher, they'll have a menu ready for you. Um, but yeah, so that is how both days lunches are gonna work. So you can try two different places if you want. Um, if you are not on the attendee Slack, stop by the Reg desk and we can make sure to get you set up and get onto that because that's how all the announcements are gonna be made and everything. And then um, the last thing is tonight's party is at the Cactus Bar and Grill, which is one of our lunch options as well. So it's on the website with a address and map. I'll also remind everyone in the attendee Slack. Um, but other than that, thank you guys for being here and uh, enjoy the next two days. Jesse Wilson, and uh, I work on a library called OKHP, which is the second most popular uh, networking library on uh, GitHub. <laughs> uh, my name is Jake Wharton. <laughs> Am I supposed to say I work on Retrofit, I guess? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is third most popular. <laughs> oh. uh, so we're, we're here to talk about Okay, uh, HTTP in general, because it's a ubiquitous thing that every app has to interact with in some form. Uh, and with that, let's get started. All right, so when we're thinking about our applications, um, a lot of the time we get really focused on the code of the applications itself. So you got, you're the, you're the Android developer and you're thinking about what is the, the code that I'm responsible for. And you sort of think about, you know, this is my activities, this is my fragments. And you work through with your team. And your, your team is like a lot focused on what code runs on the device, on your client. And um, this, this is like a one sort of perspective of the application. But the, uh, the, there's this other team, usually, which is the server team. And there are like a bunch of really annoying programmers who have different opinions as to how things should work. And they've got their universe of the world. And they think of their application as just the server. But in reality, the most interesting part of your application isn't the client or the server. It's the messages that you transmit back and forth. And so today we're going to talk about this like missing layer of your application, the layer that's shared between the client and the server. And um, there's a lot of interesting things about like how this layer gets designed. A lot of times it's the server team who makes decisions and says, yo, this is the API, figure out how to make this work for you. And so there's, uh, you know, we, the, we client developers are making decisions about how we're gonna call those APIs, but not necessarily um, what the APIs look like. And there's, you know, some potentially a difference. So, what we're here to talk about today is about optimizing the network and figuring out exactly like what's actually happening here. Not necessarily the code that's running on the device or the code that's running on the server, but the data that's traveling back and forth and how you can make it fast, small, save some battery. All right, so the first thing we're gonna look at is what's called round trip time, uh, otherwise normally abbreviated RTT. And this is uh, how long it takes for any data coming from the client to make its way to the server, for the server to process it, and then ultimately respond to you uh, on the client. A lot of times we think about this in terms of HTTP requests. So our client sends a request with some data, server processes it, returns a result, and the round trip time would be how long that takes from the client perspective from when you started sending to when you were able to finish reading the body. And so things, you know, a lot of things go into this. Uh, maybe you normally think about how many headers are going into it, how large the body is, whether it's compressed or not. And we'll get to that stuff. Um, but what I want to start with is actually the connection over which you're communicating. How expensive is that to set up? Uh, so the, if you're all using HTTPS, which hopefully you all are using HTTPS, uh, there's this thing called transport layer security, which is the uh, protocol that essentially encrypts the communication between the client and the server, uh, abbreviated TLS, and it is what puts the S in HTTPS. 
So it secures the actual connection itself and doesn't really know what's being communicated over the connection. It's just, uh, it's just concerned about the encrypting whatever is, is flowing over it. So if, you, if your app is opening and you, you know, you're reaching out to make that initial request, uh, what does it take to set up this secure connection to the server? Um, we're going to start looking at TLS 1.2, which is the latest version of the spec. So the client's going to reach out to the server, uh, thinking that it knows who it is, and ask them, ask them to uh, basically prove that they're who they say they are. That they want to. If I'm speaking to Jesse and I want to say I want to talk to you about something very secret, do you want to do? Do you want to talk in a secret manner? Jesse says, "Yes, that's very important." We have to uh, the timer's very handshake. Yeah. So then, me as the client, I go and I initiate. A secret handshake. <laughs> and after that, since we both did the same thing, essentially, um, I now know Jesse is who he say he is, and he knows that I'm uh, who I say I am. Trust is established. And so now we can actually start having our communication about something secret. So normal requests and normal responses. If, if I've talked to Jesse before, which I have, I know Jesse. Um, I don't want to go through that whole ordeal every single time. Because it's expensive, it takes time, we kind of look like a fool in front of 200 people. Uh, and so there's a variant of this, um, which is called session resumption, which is if you've talked to a server before, you can say, I think I remember you, and I think you're going to remember me. And so when I walk up to Jesse, I can just do an abbreviated and like, oh yeah, that's Jesse. So it's less expensive. We don't have to go through the whole ordeal. And now I can start actually talking to Jesse as we're doing the handshake under the assumption that he's going to know the handshake. And so if he does something wrong, like goes to high five me when I go to shake his hand uh, and I start talking, I immediately know to stop talking because that's not Jesse. That's someone and dressed in a Jesse costume. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so the key point here is that um, Instead of having to wait for a second round trip to do the actual handshake and recognition, uh, I can start communicating right away uh, with the server under the assumption that it's going to work out. So there's a draft for the next version of, of TLS, which is actually aimed to ensure that we always don't have to wait for those that complicated handshake that we can do it in the more optimal, um, faster, shorter way. So when you first talk to the server, when I first walk up to Jesse, uh, I start with my fist out and we fist bump. He responds and then I can immediately, again, start talking to him. Uh, and so this now becomes the default where you don't have to do the expensive handshake every time. Um, there is a shorter version of this, but it still requires the same number of round trips. You just send less data. So instead of you know shaking his hand twice and then fist bumping, we just fist bump. Uh, but more importantly, there's something called uh, zero RTT setup. Uh, what's great about this is you can I can walk up to Jesse and I can just start talking to him in a secure manner. But I walk out with my fist up, uh, and as I'm talking, he has to acknowledge that in a way that I understand and recognize, and then he can even start talking back to me before I get his fist bump. It's very technical. <laughs> um, but the important part is that you can start immediately communicating a server without those extra round trips. Uh, so what we do is we, in, in actually talking about HTTP terms, which I guess we should probably do, um, we sneak the request in with the initial connection handshake. So instead of waiting, instead of saying, hey, do you want to speak TLS, and then waiting for the server to say yes, we say, we're going to speak TLS, and here's the thing I'm requesting. The server can then uh, acknowledge that and say, OK, I want to speak TLS. Oh, and here's the response for the request that you sent. So there's a bunch of different uh, variants here. And the important thing is the number on the right, which is the number of round trips. Uh, and so what we didn't talk about is the cost of a round trip. These are usually anywhere from 100 to 300 milliseconds. Uh, and that's because we're on mobile and we also have the speed of light to contend with. And, and also the speed of the server that has to actually do the um, encryption, right? Because these are secured 
this is a, a secure connection, so we actually have to do the encryption part, which is meant to actually be slow during this handshake. And so as client developers, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do here. You can check to see which version of TLS your app is using, if you're using OKHTP. On the response object, uh, we expose the secret handshake that you and your server participated in, and it will come back as a, a string that will show you what version of TLS. It's probably 1.2, hopefully. Um, you can't do anything directly about this, except for maybe bother your server team about uh, ensuring that they are using the latest version. One other thing to keep in mind here is, is that um, as Android uh, evolves, older, uh, lousier SSL suites get retired, and soon it will be impossible to be able to you know, make a secure connection to old servers. And so you really want to be uh, proactive and tell your server team, we need to be using the latest, the latest, most secure versions of TLS with the best cipher suites. And you want to make sure that somebody on your server administrator is taking care of these things. Because at some point, if you don't do anything, it will just stop working, especially on uh, newer phones. Yeah, it's the same as Chrome. You wouldn't use a 10 version, old version of Chrome to connect to the web. Uh, it's always, you always want to be using the latest. It's the same here with this. Uh, you always, if you're always using the latest version of OkHTP or another library, We'll, we will try to make sure that you're always supporting the latest things, but it still requires the server to also be updated. So TLS is the layer below what well, most of us Android application developers are thinking about as just how the system works. We just say, give me an HTTPS session and you're up and running. Um, and so the layer that most of us are thinking about is HTTP or HTTP 1.1. And we're thinking about you know, what are the paths and what are the URLs for all my requests. But we don't necessarily have to spend much time thinking about the underlying uh, sockets. And I want to just spend you know, a lot of this talk talking about what's actually happening behind the scenes so that when things are working well, you have a good sense as to why. And when they're not working as well, you have a feeling as to what you can go and investigate. Um, probably the most interesting uh, design constraint of HTTP is that it's half duplex, which is a fancy way of saying only one person is speaking at a, at a time, one party is speaking at a time. So the uh, client will make a request, and the server will respond. And it's like a human conversation. We take turns. There's, uh, there's no crosstalk, and every party is either listening or, or talking, but never both at the same time. Um, HTTP is a text-based protocol inside of the uh, TLS encryption. So once you take the encrypted layer off, it's plain text. And if you use tools like Charles Proxy, you can actually just look and see exactly what text was sent between client and server. This is, uh, this is really handy and really simple. And if you are like, trying to debug something, you can just open it up and look inside. And that's one of my favorite things about HTTP. It's really transparent. You can just see all the moving parts. There's no, there's no magic in here. It's just everything you, uh, everything that you're sending from client to server, you can look at. And if you have a disagreement, you know why isn't it working? You can just say, in an email or in a, in a, uh, whatever Slack message, you can say these are the headers I'm sending, and you can easily diagnose problems this way. Um, the uh, the way the the actual protocol works is client sends a message with a request line, like uh, usually it's a method like get or post. The URL in this case. The URL is uh, appended to the host, so in this case, it'd be like square.com colon 443 slash, and then the protocol version and some headers, and then the server will respond with a status line like HTTP 100, 1.1, 200, OK. And so um, this is the HTTP boilerplate of every single message. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the times when we're making our Android applications, we have sort of two different types of HTTP requests that we're making. Uh, one type of them, we think of the resources as like a fancy file system. And so you can think of the network <laughs> as just a file system where you say, you know, give me payments.html or give me my logo.ping file. And now all of this data we sort of just think of as static, never changing data that's not interactive. And you can download it. And if your server's configured correctly, it will just cache those resources forever on your device. The other thing that's really neat about HTTP is we can use this exact same protocol also in an interactive fashion. So you can make API requests against endpoints and say, I'd like to you know, initiate a payment, or I'd like to uh, change some settings. 
And those endpoints work almost exactly the same way, but they're interactive. And so it's a really nice system where you can get static and, and dynamic uh, behavior all from the same system. Um, when, we're, uh, when we're actually making our requests, one of the problems that we inevitably run into is how do we figure out what the granularity of our APIs looks like? Um, and there's a lot of really bad options here. It's really complicated. So we could say, hey, server, give me a list. Um, Jake and I both work on an app called Square Cash, and it has to do with payments, so we're going to do a lot of payments examples. We're going to say, hey, hey, give me all the payments I've, con I've completed recently. And the server will say, sure, here's, here's a list of payments. And so we could have a single file with all of the payments, or we could have a single file with addresses for the payments. Another place that you see this come up a lot is with websites. Uh, where you have a ton of different resources that can either be separate or all in a single file. So with an API that just returns a list of payments, if you want to make a bunch of follow-up requests for details on those payments, uh, one of the reasons we talked about TLS is that if these happen over individual connections, you have to pay the cost of setting up the connection for every single one of those follow-up requests. So it starts to get really slow, it starts to get really expensive. Yeah, this is where you like open the screen and you just see like each row loading row by row and it's really sad. Um, so one of the biggest features that was in HTTP 1.1 that makes it different from HTTP 1.0 is that once you do the initial connection, um, the client makes the request, the server returns the response, but you can, I, continue to make more requests and responses as you go. Um, this works very nicely, but it's always client's turn, server's turn, client's turn, server's turn. And so this works really well until one of the server's responses takes a long time to send, or one of the client's responses takes a long, requests takes a long time to uh, transmit. So if you have a queue of 20 different things you want to do, and the third one ends up taking six seconds, then the fourth through the 20th, I'll wait for that one, and that totally is lame. Yeah, so this is referred to as head of line blocking, uh, which we'll refer to again later in the talk. So head of line blocking would be like, you go to the bank, and there's one teller, and like you just want to get 20 bucks, but the person in front of you wants to like buy get out Morgan, buy a house. <laughs> yeah, so that, that person's awful. Um, so uh, what most HTTP clients will do, including OKHP, is it will create additional connections for uh, concurrent requests. And this would be like the bank opening up multiple different tellers to serve different, different parties. So this is faster, but there's additional setup time for each of the requests. So we bring up a new connection, and then we can start to use it. And then if we need to make more requests concurrently, we bring up more connections. And there's a lot of complexity and cost. And there's a lot of chatter on the network. We're sending lots of packets. We're keeping our radio on for a long time as we set up all these connections and we do all these uh, requests. Yeah, so again, uh, just another place you see this is back in that web example. If you're writing a web application, you have you know, your HTML, which is the markup. You probably have some JavaScript and maybe a few libraries, style files, uh, also potentially from a few libraries, sprites, uh, which shows icons on the page, and then maybe you know, some hero images or whatever. And if you need to request these as individual resources, you would have to do so with 22 individual requests. Now, these can happen over multiple connections at the same time, but you still have the overhead of making each one of these individual requests. An unfortunate pattern that's emerged, and we'll talk about why it's unfortunate in a second, is that you take the common resources and slam them together. All the JavaScript files get concatenated to a single one. All the styles get concatenated to a single file. All the icons get shoved together into these sprite sheets uh, where this is all the emojis on Slack. So they only download a single image uh, for every single possible emoji. Uh, and then finally, uh, because we have a limit on the number of connections that clients will make to a server, you'll see things done like sharding this across multiple domains. Uh, because these have different hosts, the client's going to treat them as you know, separate servers that it's talking to, and so each one will get a bunch of different uh, multiple connections. 
So if you change one of these files, if you change the HTML, that's usually okay, the whole file will be re-downloaded. But now that we have these concatenated assets, if you change a single sprite, if you change a single style, if you change a single line of JavaScript, the entire asset has to be re-downloaded. If Slack adds a new uh, emoji to their emoji sprite, that whole file has to be re-downloaded instead of just the first time you use that new emoji. Uh, and then additionally, like you can even run into problems after sharding domains where you start hosting more images. Now you have to start splitting up your images onto multiple domains. And so what we're doing here in this example is contorting the way that we build our applications into uh, fundamentally different structures for how we deploy it to work around these limitations of HTTP. And so this is, uh, the web is kind of the common example that you see this for, but uh, it turns out this is not the only place that we do this. Yeah, so our Android apps are not exempt from all of these problems. And when, again, getting back to this example of like, what do my APIs look like? Do I make a single API request that tells me everything I could ever possibly need to show on the screen? Or do I make different API requests for every single text field? But neither of these is particularly good, but there's some happy balance. Um, so you, you might see an API that says, you know, give me the, give me all the payments that I've ever made, and then for each of these payments, you have to make a separate request for each. This is really um, normalized, and then what I really like about this design is that if you have, you know, a history of 70 payments, and only the ones from today and yesterday end up changing because you know the the person you're sending the money to deposits it, or the person sending the money to says, you know, actually it's an extra dollar. Um, when you have these back and forth uh, operations, you don't have to re-download every single element in the list. Um, so most of the data historically is static, but if you design your APIs so that you just get everything in really, really massive blobs of data, um, you end up parsing and downloading and munging a bunch of data that's completely unnecessary. So we end up sort of like fighting the system, fighting the design of it, where we say every resource has its own URL in order to work around the, uh, the, the sort of complexity of how do we design our APIs. Um, one thing that's really interesting here is, is that when we have these really big endpoints that return a lot of data, we break our ability to cache responses. So in this case, if I've got 20 different payments that I'm returning in a single response, I have no idea which of those payments has changed and which of those payments is, uh, is exactly the same as it's always been. And so we end up making our devices just do all this unnecessary work. Um, so that leads into HTTP2. Uh, HTTP 1.1 is almost 20 years old, I think 18 years. Uh, and in the interim, Google did a bunch of work on how they can optimize connections from browsers. And from that work, uh, a bunch of parties got together in the IETF and created the second version of HTTP2. Well, the second major version, I should say. And the goal being to solve these fundamental problems that we just looked at. Uh, the inability to have very granular requests, the tendency to batch things together and shard across domains to work around how the client behaves. And so if, uh, if we look at HTTP2, if we're speaking HTTP2 from your application layer, from the code that you're writing, you still see the half duplex semantics, the request and the response. You send a single request and then it eventually be, gets fulfilled in a response. In the protocol, however, what's actually being sent over the, over the wire, over that connection, it's actually full duplex. And what this means is that both parties can be talking to each other at the same time, and you don't have to wait for a response in order to start sending more data. And so in this payments case where uh, you know, I get a list of IDs and then I want to request 20 individual payments, I can, after receiving the list, I can fire off all 20 of those requests immediately and they will all be uh, sent as fast as possible, and then the server will re retrieve all of those and return them back as individual responses as fast as it can. So this is a very pretty view of it. 
Um, you know, there's things like network latency and how long the server takes, and so normally these things are sort of chaotic and come back in uh, slightly out of order. But um, normally, what, you know, earlier we showed you these like this arrow that went down and it caused that head of line blocking. What's nice about this is there there is no head of line blocking, even though some of these responses are taking a lot longer than others. And that's because uh, at the protocol layer, HTTP2 can chop them up into smaller chunks and then interleave them. So you're actually reading multiple responses at the same time. So what I really like about this property of HTTP2 is, is that by making it so that the cost of any individual request gets really low, it makes it possible for us to design really simple, granular APIs. So if currently you're doing a lot of batching and a lot of paging and you're grouping things together, and then you end up downloading more data than you need to do, with HTTP2, we're going to start being able to design APIs where you ask for just the data you want, and you're going to be able to cache it. So if we do our payments API design, and we say, let's make every single payment get its own URL. And then when we ask for 20 payments, we can cache them all independently. And with uh, OKHP, you can cache each URL independently. And it mostly just works. You don't have to think about it. Uh, you just say, give me payment 45, and it will just be served off of your device's disk cache and not making a trip to the network. Yeah, so for these six, we end up not having to even make requests over the network. So there's one more thing that I think is really cool about this HTTP caching model, which is that with, uh, sometimes you say, okay, let's give me payment 45, and you don't necessarily know if you have an up-to-date copy of it or not. Built into the HTTP protocol is this mechanism called conditional gets. And the way that this works is you say, hey, server, give me, I've got, uh, payment 45 from yesterday at 2 p.m. I'd like to get it again, and the server will say, it's the exact same, I won't send you the bytes again. And so this is a great opportunity for the uh, client and the server to save bandwidth and for the server to save work. So you can make a ton of requests speculatively say, download all of my you know, data, show me all my messages, and only the ones that are updated need to be transmitted. This requires a lot of work on the server team to support this sort of thing. But your server team may be very eager to do this because if your client supports it, then every request that they can serve uh, back to the back from your cache is a request that they don't need to have hardware to satisfy. And the great thing about this is because you're not transferring entire bodies of these payments that are up to date or, or any resource, they tend to come up, they tend to come back a lot faster from the server because it's just saying use the thing you already have, and then it's served from the local file system instead of being yeah. read across the network. A good, good example of this would be like if you're building a social app and you've got you know, all of the people in your friends group and you say, you know, give me Jake's profile, but I have the profile from yesterday. The server will be like, yep, it, nothing has changed. But when you do change your profile, then I get the freshest version almost immediately. So another big feature of HTTP2 is called server push. Uh, and so in our example we've been using, we get a list of IDs of payments from our initial request. And then the client receives that and makes a bunch of follow-up requests for more details on those payments. From the server perspective, however, when a client comes in and says, give me a list of payments, there's an extremely high probability that the next requests that are going to be made from that client are for the details of those individual payments. And that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, however, we're waiting for the response to come back. We're waiting to parse that list of IDs to know which IDs to send requests for. Uh, server push allows the server to essentially initiate the response before we even make a request. That's what it effectively looks like from you know, the application layer. Um, however, there's a slight catch, which is that the server doesn't really know about which payments we actually need to download and which payments we have from the client side. Um, so just as an example, we can maybe include the latest ID that we've seen locally in our request for the list. And what this allows the server to do is say, in this list that I'm returning, 
there are five IDs that are more recent than the last one the client thinks it has seen. And so I'm gonna take the, the payment details and I'm gonna start pushing them down to the client so that when it sees that new ID and subsequently makes a request for it, I don't have to, that doesn't have to get sent all the way over the network and then I have to look it up in the database and start sending it back. It can just hook up to the response that's already being delivered and start reading it immediately. So you get the, you get the benefit of serving these big batches right away, but without the cost of breaking your cache. And ultimately, if the client decides that it doesn't need these responses, uh, it can actually cancel out of them, but that's something that will be happening probably in the HTTP client itself, not at your application layer. Uh, and what's great is that the other things we've talked about still work. So if one of the payments that I already have is out of date, like Jesse just talked about, I can still make that request and the server can still return you know, 304, but these are all happening now concurrently. So you have this diagram that's super smashed together with a bunch of arrows, um, which is hard to read, but this is actually really good because it means that that connection between the client and the server is being uh, always utilized. And so uh, an important point is that OKHTP doesn't actually support server push right now. Working on it. We're working on it. He's working on it. <laughs> it's hard. But if you, look, if you compare this directly to the original HTTP 1.1 example with concurrent connections. Um, time is you know, represented here vertically. So we still set up the connection with TLS, which are the orange arrows. We still make the request for the list of payments, but now we don't have to wait for the response to come back in order for the server to start pushing the payment details. And we also don't have to have multiple connections and pay the cost of setting up uh, TLS multiple times. Yeah, so your, uh, your application ends up be becoming a lot faster, and a lot of this work is free. Yeah, so no head of line blocking here. Um, you don't have the inherent overhead of defining a granular API. Caching still works. Uh, you don't have to contort your deployments um, to you know, smash together unrelated data just to deliver it in one response. So earlier we were talking about how HTTP 1 is text-based and it's half-duplex or conversational with this request response semantic. With HTTP 2, it feels the same way and it looks the same way, but everything is actually happening concurrently and the uh, request and response bodies can be in a leak. So the client says, you know, give me this request, the server says return me this response. And with HTTP 2, we wrap the request and responses into these things called frames, which are just like, little tiny pieces of data that say this is request number one, this is request number two, and when the, uh, when the server sends them back and forth, we can just match up this request goes with this response, even if they come out of order. Um, yeah, so here we see you know, two requests being sent before any response is received, and then when a response is received, we just use the ID in the HTTP client to map it back to the appropriate request. Uh, yeah, that's just what I said. Uh, the uh, request and response bodies are also s split out into separate frames, and so you can actually send a single frame of half of the request and then the second half. And so this means that like, if you're spooling data from your database and your database stalls or whatever, you don't have to stall the entire connection. Uh, and again, this is what allows responses to also interleave. So you can be streaming two responses at the same time and getting chunks from each one uh, back up through your application yeah. layer. And if you think about what your device is actually doing, it's turning on its uh, LTE or its 3G radio, and you want that radio just to be super busy while it's on, and then you want to shut it off. And so with HP2, we have all of this data just like coming in as a fire hose in your device, and then it can be shut off. Uh, so we've got two different requests looking in this thing, and you can look at these frames, and you can just see how duplicate our, our requests are. So we say request number one, we've got a URL, a host user agent, and a bunch of like boilerplate. And with HTTP 1.1, we keep sending this boilerplate over and over and over again. Even though the, the resources are different, 
all of this stuff is exactly the same. And so HTTP2 has a feature that cleans this up as well. Instead of wasting all the bytes on the header names, we just look them up in a table. This is called HPAC compression. And so there's already just very short uh, names for every single thing. It's just a single byte. Um, we can also do the same thing on the responses where, or sorry, on the header values. So with every header, once we send a value once, the server will remember what values we've sent, and we can associate that with an ID. And so subsequent requests, we can just send the exact same ones. And this happens both when clients send headers to the server and also when servers send responses to the client. So even though you may have a ton of headers in your HTTP2 request, only the very first request pays for them. And therefore, the longer you use your single HTTP2 connection, the more efficient it goes, because you and your, your client, your server, get more, con more shared context. So HP2's framing means that we have, we go from this like slow, full duplex, plain text mechanism to this super fast, heavily interleaved, very compressed mechanism. And your client is almost none the wiser. Everything is just getting faster for free and more concurrent. Um, the compression is happening, the interleaving is happening, and so you make a bunch of requests and everything is just there instantly. Uh, and so if you're using OKHP, you can ask, you know, what protocol am I using? And if you're using anything other than H2, you should make friends with your server team and say, yo, I don't want to make my server, I want to make my network faster. Uh, you know, deploy the new version of Nginx, and they'll do it, and they'll, like, everybody will celebrate, you can get pizza. Yeah, so this only works on Lollipop and newer. And if you actually try this on a JVM, if you copy paste this code into IntelliJ or whatever and run it, you actually see HTTP 1, even if you're connecting to a server that talks HTTP 2. Uh, and that's because Java itself doesn't have built-in support for the initial negotiation. Uh, that'll be built into Java 9. And there are ways to do it on older versions of Java, but your server people can Google that. Cool. Uh, okay, so up until now we've been talking about the protocol HTTP and the protocol TLS. Um, a lot of times even that is something that you don't really think about at the application layer, uh, but payloads, by payloads I mean the bodies of the requests and responses. These are the things that you tend to deal with the most, the actual meat of the requests and responses that have the interesting bits that you care about and that wind up in your databases and user interfaces. Uh, so obviously, sending data over uh, a, a network, we want to send as few bytes as possible. And so this is why you hear about things like Zopfli for compressing images, Broccoli for compressing stuff, um, WebP, which is a more byte efficient image format, and debates about things like JSON versus protocol buffers. Uh, up until now, we've been showing JSON in our examples. But um, you might expect us to evangelize protocol buffers. But uh, actually, Jesse, a few years ago, when Square was actually switching from JSON to protocol buffers, did a bunch of investigation. Uh, and so if all you care about is the number of bytes being transferred, if you're gzipping your JSON, which your server should be doing, uh, the actual number of bytes that you're sending is going to be, on average, about the same. And so there's no huge wins to be had in just the number of bytes being transmitted by switching between these two serialization formats. Uh, protocol buffers, for those that don't know, are you define a type typed schema that are shared between client and server, uh, and it allows the data to be encoded in a binary format uh, using like these indices. And so a response like this would actually only take eight bytes on the wire instead of the 42 that the JSON takes. But again, uh, gzip would put those a lot closer together. And especially when these responses are a lot larger, um, gzip's going to work a lot better. But so while we feel that protocol buffers are superior in basically every single way to JSON, uh, JSON's the serialization format that has won the web. Uh, and so it's very pervasive, and so I want to instead talk about optimizations that can be made at that level. If you look at this, uh, and having seen the 
HTTP section that we just talked about, it sort of looks similar to the headers in a request or response, right? We have these key value pairs separated by delimiters. Um, but unlike what we did in HTTP2, where we replaced them with single bytes over time, JSON is self-descriptive, and so these keys are actually always required, and we have no way of actually removing them or making them more efficient uh, without essentially breaking the point of JSON. If we look at uh, what parsers do, however, we can potentially find ways to optimize uh, even still. So a traditional parser is going to come in and you know, read the opening curly brace, find the opening, uh, find a quote, which signifies that I'm about to get a key in the JSON. It will seek ahead until it finds the corresponding uh, quote. And so this is the entirety of a key. It will take the bytes that are between those two. Uh, and because this is Java, which I mean, I'm going to assume most of that here, um, what's going to happen is this is coming over the wire in bytes. And these have to be decoded from bytes into characters in Java, which is probably done through UTF-8, and then ultimately wrapped inside a string object. Now with that string object, your JSON parser probably has a map of keys to something that knows how to parse the values. And so that string is going to be uh, used to do a hash lookup in, say, a hash map to find the corresponding adapter for, in this case, an ID, which we represent in Java as a long. And that adapter will resume pulling bytes off the wire and parsing them as an integer, uh, or a long, rather, and then ultimately turning that into a Java long, which then we push into the you know, corresponding field in the Java object that you define. And so that was just a single key value pair. This is going to happen over and over inside the JSON object for every key value pair. So we're going to decode the bytes into character array. We're going to create the string allocation. We're going to look at that adapter up in a map. We're going to hand the bytes to the adapter to decode the data over and over again. And if you have nested JSON, that's going to keep recursing. And we'll be doing this for all the keys and values inside that object. So if you, uh, if you benchmark your JSON parser, you're going to see it's just all it's doing is allocating strings and throwing them away. And with uh, this library we created, Mashi, we decided, hey, there's like stuff we can learn from HTTP2 here. We can just make it so that rather than doing all this work on strings, we, can, we already know what the header names are going to be. They're going to be ID and amount and currency. We can just pre create those bytes and do all the work. Yeah, so this, this is especially wasteful when you have lists of responses coming back. Uh, so you have to do this for every key over and over again. And so what Mashi does, as Jesse alluded, is that we pre-compute the bytes of these keys. And then as we're parsing through the responses, we can just match the bytes as we go along, find the key that matches the bytes with no decoding, no string wrapper. Using the index of the key that matched, we can look up the adapter in you know, an associated list, and then you get the same behavior of you know, taking over and parsing the value. Uh, and what's great about this approach is that we only have to do this uh, pre-encoding of the keys once, and then we can reuse that over and over again. So even if you have the list of objects, you only pay to encode those keys once. Uh, and so this is in a library called Mashi. It's a spiritual successor of JSON, sort of. Um, and it's, it's small and pragmatic. Uh, and it is, as far as I know, the only one that does this technique for parsing. So, so the, uh, the last thing we want to touch on is that all of these requests and responses are initiated by the client. The client says, this is some data I want. Server says, here you go, this is a response. But sometimes the server is detecting some event from the outside world, and it wants just to notify the client, here, here's, something you should, here's, here's something you should know. Here's an event that's happened. And so with uh, WebSockets, the server is the ability to push events into the client. And this is really powerful um, because it means that you can build applications like chat without constantly polling or any of these hacks that make it so that your server can send you data late. Um, the, uh, the most important thing about WebSocket is it's really good for the, client, the servers to notify the clients of events. It's less good at anything where um, 
the client wants to have a receipt that the request they made was uh, acknowledged because there's no mechanism in WebSockets to acknowledge that a message was received. Um, let's uh, go to, so the, uh, if you'd like to learn more about WebSockets, Chris is going to be presenting on WebSockets in Gray Room 2 today at 3 p.m. Uh, there's also a talk on Retrofit, which is above this layer, uh, but Retrofit uses OKHTP, and OKHTP has most of the optimizations that we talked about built in. And I'll be presenting on coordinating space and time, and this is where I'm going to talk about some of the concurrency that's happening behind the scenes in these layers. But, uh, additionally, there are two talks that Jesse and I gave at previous conferences. Um, the link, if you can't see, is in the URL bar. Um, a few OK libraries is about uh, this suite of libraries that work well together, and those include Retrofit, OKHTP, OKIO, and Mashi. And the talk where we go deep into the details of protocol buffers and JSON is called The Code and the Secrets of Binary Data, and that's where we're actually going to look in deep and see where are these individual bytes, uh, how, how they add up. So, as we said, uh, HTTP, to, HTTP is ubiquitous. Um, it's not going anywhere. And so optimizations like these, over time, despite being incredibly small, actually compound across all your users, all devices, uh, and so you can save terabytes worth of data, uh, weeks worth of delay, across your entire user base. Thank you. Thank you.